Dear friends and delegates to the International Peace Bureau Congress, please forgive me for speaking to you from a remote location. By staying home, I save jet fuel and jet lag. The advantage for you, possibly, is that you may be getting a better speech. Classical political economy had the merit of shifting the foundations of wealth from plunder to productivity, from pillage to labor, augmented by large and stable markets. In this, for the first time, peace was implied, and the advantages of peace were recognized. Adam Smith wrote that commerce ought naturally to be among nations a bond of union and friendship, although he immediately recognized that the opposite, discord and animosity, was often the case. He wrote, the capricious ambition of kings and ministers has not during the present and preceding century been more fatal to the repose of Europe than the impertinent jealousy of merchants and manufacturers. Yet the opposing view, which rooted power in plunder and then by extension in trade and specifically in a trade surplus, this is the mercantilist position, was not an irrational position. Plunder and trade surpluses did and do lead to rising power in financial terms, and financial power translates into other forms. This was true of the United States after 1918, and it was true of Germany and Japan, constrained though they were by the post-war settlement after 1945. It's been true most recently of China that power once obtained tends to be preserved by whatever means, including military means, is a fact that accounts for the apparently anomalous position of the United States, still at the peak of world military power and to a large extent at the center of world finance, despite an enormous industrial erosion in recent decades. This is a precarious position, in part because the past 15 years and the American experience in Afghanistan and in Iraq especially demonstrate that in the modern world, military power has very little practical use. You can destroy, you can kill, you can take territory, but you cannot hold it. You cannot sustain your influence there. And the test of power, the test of success in the modern world is not whether you can start a war. It's not even whether you can win one. It's whether you can end it on successful, sustainable terms and leave behind a society that is capable of advancing uh, in line with the values that you ostensibly express at the beginning. There are many issues to discuss here, but in the short time I have, I would like to call your attention and to focus your attention on one especially. The precarity of American power can be invoked to explain the decision, which was announced a week or so ago in the New York Times, not finally to forego the doctrine of the first use of nuclear weapons. The arguments that were cited and had been made to the American president by the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Ashton Carter, were that potential adversaries would take such a stand as a sign of weakness. But it is obvious that the refusal to renounce the nuclear first strike doctrine is an admission of the most profound weakness. A nation that was confident 
in the larger moral appeal of its social and political system would not be worried about appearing weak. And an adversary that felt truly threatened by an opponent with superior moral and social standing would not misinterpret the renunciation of the first use of New York nuclear weapons as a sign of weakness. On the contrary, they would take it as a sign of confidence and strength. It is worth knowing, too, that in past times, the actual, as opposed to the stated nuclear policy of the United States, was substantially more pacific than is commonly understood. Daniel Ellsberg's memoir, Secrets, makes it clear that Presidents Kennedy and Johnson had privately forsworn the first use of nuclear weapons, even though NATO doctrine, to which they ostensibly subscribed, stated the opposite. And President Reagan, contrary to what we activists of the 1980s thought at the time, actively pursued in secret, by secret correspondence, nuclear abolition with General Secretary Gorbachev of the Soviet Union. These facts were secret only because they would have been politically toxic in the United States, where the merchants and manufacturers of these weapons and their delivery systems actually reside, where the impertinent jealousies of which Adam Smith wrote remain strong. Today, though, I believe we are obliged to take Secretary Carter at face value. The reaffirmation of the first strike doctrine aims to patch up a manifest military weakness, a precarious financial position, and a deeply damaged moral standing, thanks to Iraq, Afghanistan, and other military failures, Libya comes to mind, but going all the way back to Vietnam. And to patch it up in the most deplorable way with a usable portion of modernized thermonuclear warheads capable of being delivered for various purposes and in very substantial numbers with yields that might range from one to an appalling 300 kilotons of explosive power. Against whom? For the moment, with Iran removed, mercifully, from the possible target list, there are only three plausible objectives, or one might say targets, of this policy. And they are North Korea, China, and Russia. In the case of North Korea, we're dealing with a state which now has nuclear weapons. And the obvious problem that there is no scenario of North Korean aggression uh, that does not involve early use of those weapons. The North Koreans are surely aware that if they should attack the South in force, or any place else for that matter, uh, they would uh, almost immediately see an attack on their nuclear facilities. They, uh, for that reason, the doctrine of first use on our side can only mean uh, a preemptive use of these weapons, that is to say, a use which is presumptively unprovoked. And even to enunciate such a doctrine with respect to North Korea is clearly a very dangerous thing to do. In the case of China, we have no active military disputes to speak of. Taiwan is somnolent and has been for quite a few years. Uh, and the South China Sea is a mess of minor legalisms. 
China's real threat to the U.S. military consists in its hypothetical capacity to demonstrate the obsolescence of aircraft carriers and other surface ships by uh, sinking them. This is a capacity which exists for technological reasons and not because the Chinese have special capabilities. Uh, and as an excuse for triggering a thermonuclear war, uh, let us only hope that it carries conviction with nobody. That leaves Russia. Here, the First Use Doctrine has a long history, back to the days when the Red Army surrounded West Berlin. It was not then a reassuring or even a realistic prospect. A good deal of effort was uh, devoted in the early 1960s Washington, as I know from my own research, uh, to making sure that I, a, uh, let's say, um, accidental or uh, unintentional first use of nuclear weapons never happened. But as a delusion, this prospect arguably did save a lot of money uh, and other grief. It was a phantom deterrent against a phantom threat. And in defense of a state, the Federal Republic of Germany, that no one thought likely to provoke the dispute, a dispute which would, of course, destroy not only Western Germany, but Eastern Germany as well. Today, though, the boundary of NATO is at the Russian frontier, it's 136 kilometers from St. Petersburg, and Konrad Adenauer is not in charge of the frontline state. To place nuclear weapons and the first strike doctrine at the disposition of Baltic politics is to say the least a very different proposition from that of the 1950s. And let's not even mention the prospect of the same happening at the frontiers of Georgia or Ukraine. It should have been obvious long ago that the expansion of NATO, whether it was or was not a good idea in itself, necessarily entailed an irreversible commitment to diplomacy, to demilitarization, and to peaceful resolution of disputes along the frontiers of the alliance. That any other approach is untenable, irresponsible, and dangerous, of no value in protecting the security of our NATO allies, of considerable risk of provoking the worst kinds of calamities, and a waste of resources into the bargain. These conclusions are not something that are by any means new. Uh, they have been uh, foretold and argued by analysts of much greater stature than myself. And I'm going to pass now to some passages written in the mid-1970s by George Kennan, a diplomat, statesman, no pacifist, in a small book called The Nuclear Delusion. First, Kennan addressed the perception of the USSR after 1945 in the American mind in terms that I think you will recognize. He wrote, quote, There emerged one of the great and forbidding apparitions to the credence in which mass opinion is so easily swayed, a monster devoid of all humanity and all rationality of motive, at once the embodiment and the caricature of evil. If you read the American press on the subject of Vladimir Putin, you will not find that passage hard to uh, transpose to present realities. Second, Kennan gave his assessment of the actual Soviet view of nuclear weapons. He wrote, the writer of these lines knows no reason to suppose that the Soviet leadership of Stalin's day 
ever allotted to the nuclear weapon anything resembling a primary role in its political or strategic concepts. There is no reason to doubt that Stalin saw this weapon as he himself described, as something with which one frightened people with weak nerves. With respect to the recent U.S. policy decision, either the policy is useless because the Russian leadership does not have weak nerves, uh, or it is simply provocative and indefensible on its face. Kennan concluded, I had always resisted the suggestion that war, as a phenomenon of international life, could be wholly ruled out. I am now bound to say that while the earliest possible elimination of nuclear weaponry is of no less vital importance in my eyes than it ever was, this would not be enough in itself to give Western civilization an even adequate chance of survival. War itself, as a means of setting, settling differences, will have to be in some way ruled out, and with it will have to go the greater part of the vast military establishments now maintained. This was true in Kennan's eyes, and perhaps exceptionally, in the Cold War setting of the 1970s. It is, if anything, far more true in the precarious position uh, that we face today. And let me conclude once again, not with my own words, but with those of an official United States agency staffed by economists, including my father, Nicholas Calder of the United Kingdom, Piero Sraffa of Italy, E.F. Schumacher of Germany, the United States Strategic Bombing Survey which reported on the atomic bombings of Japan in 1945. You may, if you like, disregard the first few sentences. I read them not because they were true, but because I believe the authors of this passage hoped that they would become true, that they would uh, state a position that would be taken up and become the prevailing vision of the post-war period. They wrote, Our national policy has consistently had as one of its basic principles the maintenance of peace. Based on our ideals of justice and of peaceful development of our resources, this disinterested policy has been reinforced by our clear lack of anything to gain in war, even in victory. No more forceful arguments for peace and for the international machinery of peace than the sight of the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki have ever been devised. Thank you for your attention and my best wishes for the success of your important work at this Congress.